Hello, today we will talk about the properties of solution and in particular we will describe colligative properties. What is a unique substance uh, for um, different reasons? In particular, uh, one thing that is characteristic of water is the fact that in the solid state, um, water has um, lower density than in the liquid state, and that's a kind of peculiar, as, um, and we'll discuss that when we're describing the diagram of state for water and CO2. So the density of water um, reaches a maximum at um, around uh, 4 Celsius. Um, above 4 Celsius, you have liquid water, and as any other substance, the density goes down as you uh, increase the temperature because of thermal dilation. But when you form ice, the density also goes down. So uh, ice has a lower density than, than water. And this is due to the fact that ice has a, a characteristic crystalline structure. Um, and so inside the crystal, you have these empty spaces that uh, kind of spread the molecule of water a little bit more in a more, uh, with larger distances that you would have otherwise. And this is, you know, the fact that uh, ice is less dense is a fortune for all the lovers of uh, uh, ice fishing. Um, so you can see from this 3D model um, how more packed is liquid water respect to, to ice. Uh, let's go uh, over the different kinds of concentration that we have uh, learned during the semester. We have been learned about um, to express the concentration of the solute as a percent by mass. And that was what we did in the first lab, uh, when we were calculating the percent by mass of a solution of salt in water. Uh, we, when we talk about gases, uh, we learn um, uh, about mole fraction. We, when we're talking about solution, we learn about molarity. Molarity is the number of moles per liter of solution. So we're going to introduce a new type of concentration that is called molality. So it's just one letter of difference, a L instead of a R. Uh, the symbol is also kind of similar, is a small m as opposed to the capital M of molarity. So it's kind of an unfortunate uh, choice of symbols. Um, so molality, the numerator of the fraction is the same, it's still mole of solute. What, what's different is the denominator of the fraction, and it's different in two ways. Uh, first of all, we are considering a mass and not a volume, and then we don't care about the whole solution, we just care about the mass of the solvent. So uh, typically we use molality in aqueous solution, so that would be the mass, the kilograms of water. Um, Molarity is used in the vast majority of the problem you might encounter in chemistry. Molality is a kind of a very specific use uh, for colligative properties. Um, colligative properties are properties of solution and include the lowering of the freezing point when you dissolve a uh, substance in uh, water. So you're all familiar with the fact that to melt ice on the roads, uh, we throw salt on the snow. Um, so the reason we have to introduce a new um, a way to calculate concentration for colligative properties is that we need to, these are properties that has to be measured at very low temperature, for example, the freezing of um, freezing point of water, or very high temperature, like the boiling point of water is also affected by the presence of, of substances dissolved. So we are um, quite away from the typical uh, room temperature of a lab, 25 Celsius. All, all the glassware that we use in the lab is calibrated at 25 Celsius. Um, as, if we are away from the temperature of a few degrees, it's not a big deal. But if we are working at very low temperature or at very high temperature, we cannot rely anymore on the calibration and on the um, uh, readings that we get from our graduated cylinder or volumetric flask. Um, the advantage of molality with a L is that all we need is a scale and we, all we have to do is measure the amount of water and the mass will be the same regardless if the solution is cold or warm. So we have a much more reliable 
um, measurement. Molarity, as I said, is what you will use almost in every other situation. Uh, in the process of dissolving a substance in water, there are three phenomena that are happening. First of all, we need to break the interaction between the molecule of solvent, so the intermolecular forces present in the solvent. The solvent is typically water, so we have to break hydrogen bonds present in the water. This is, an, uh, as every uh, bond breaking, is an endothermic process that requires energy. We also need to break the interaction between the molecule of, sol of the solute so that the molecule can be separated. Let's imagine, for example, that the solute is sodium chloride. So we would have to provide the lattice energy. So this is also an endothermic uh, process with a positive energy. Finally, when the uh, ions of sodium, or, uh, sodium ion and chloride ion, ion are going to be interacting with the molecule of water, we would have the forming of new intermolecular bonds uh, that are dipole ion bonds. So this time, um, the process is going to be exothermic. And this is called delta H of solvation. So the total delta H of the um, overall process is going to be the sum of these three components. And it could come up either positive or negative, depending on which one is preponderant. If uh, the balance is such that delta H of solution is overall zero, we would say that this, um, this solution is behaving ideally. So we have an ideal solution when the del delta H total is equal to zero. The fact that the delta H of solution is either positive, negative, or zero affects the way a change in temperature would change the solubility of the substance. So in this graph, we can see the solubility of several um, ionic compounds when we increase the temperature. The majority of those uh, lines and curves show a positive slope. So for the majority of the substances, an increase in, in uh, temperature increases the solubility. Um, if the solution would be ideal, so if the total balance would be equal to zero, if the delta H of solution would be zero, we would find uh, no effect of the temperature on the solubility, and the line would be a perfectly horizontal line parallel to the x-axis. Now, none of those graphs show that behavior. However, uh, the uh, sodium chloride comes pretty close to being an horizontal line. There is, a, uh, uh, there is a slope, but it's quite limited. So the fact that all those, um, the majority of the substances show a positive slope uh, indicates that those processes are endothermic. So the overall um, balance is a positive delta H. So we, to dissolve, um, at the end of the day, we need to provide energy. Therefore, by warming up the solution, we are facilitating the dissolution. If instead, we see a negative slope, and the only uh, instance is really this, that is cesium uh, sulfate. Um, that means that the process is exothermic. So the process is giving off heat. If we make the solution um, warmer, we are actually uh, contrasting the dissolution, making it harder. Other two substances for which the dissolution is endothermic are mannitol and ammonium nitrate. So mannitol is a substance that's used in the food industry as an additive for food. Um, it is a structure that um, it's similar to a sugar, although it's not properly a sugar, and it's quite sweet. And um, the dissolution of mannitol is also um, endothermic, so it's added to chewing gum and uh, where um, the dissolving in the saliva will absorb heat from the mouth and give a pleasant uh, feeling of freshness. Uh, the name mannitol comes from the word manna that's used in the Bible to indicate um, the miracle by which food was provided to the Jewish. Um, and, and the reason is that the sub, this substance is particularly uh, rich in the secretion of a tree, of an ash tree, that's called Fraxinus. And so it was uh, collected in the, in the past uh, and, and eaten, and so it was uh, named manna after the manna that's mentioned in the Bible. And from, from there, the, the substance took the name of mannitol. As I said, another substance is uh, potassium nitrate that is used in uh, uh, coal packs. 
so in the COPEX, you have two compartments. One is the this, um, ammonium nitrate, dry, and in the other one, you have the water. And so when you activate the package, you squeeze them and you mix them, and the dissolution of um, ammonium nitrate in water absorbs heat from the part of the body on which you have uh, put the, uh, the cold compress. It's worth remembering a little bit of uh, Lewis structures and Vesper theory. So in ammonium, the central atom is surrounded by four electron regions, while in, uh, while in um, the nitrate ion, there are only three regions around it. So the geometry of um, um, the ammonium ion is a tetrahedral geometry, while here you have a trigonal planar in the nitrate, you have a trigonal planar geometry. The hybridization of the ammonium is sp3, while the hybridization of the nitrate is going to be sp2. So the reason why uh, the bonds in uh, the nitrate are uh, represent so you, you see uh, there are uh, three single bonds between nitrogen and oxygen and then three other bonds that are represented as a dotted line those are the localized electron because nitrate is the result is the hybrid of three resonance structures uh, that are equivalent they they differ only for the position in which the double bond is either on top or the left or the right. So instead of writing th all three, that would take a lot of space and, uh, space and time, it's convenient to adopt this representation where the double bond, we don't take a commitment about the position of a double bond, we kind of spread it um, all over the molecule and we represent it with this dotted line. So one of the properties of Lix that's quite important is surface tension. So let's consider uh, this molecule of water here in the middle. It's surrounded in a very symmetrical way by a molecule of water in, in every direction. Those molecules of water have hydrogen bonds with the central molecule, and so therefore there is an attraction. So we can represent these intermolecular forces as vectors. And so this, this uh, central molecule is kind of pulled in all direction by the other molecule of water. Because the distribution of the molecule around it is so symmetrical, all these vectors are eventually going to cancel out. So the net force acting to this molecule of water in the middle is zero. But the situation is different for this molecule of water. These two are going to cancel out, but this, I have nothing to cancel them out. So I could build a uh, sum of all these vectors, there's going to be a net force pulling down towards the middle of the solution, the molecule of water. So for each molecule that's situated at the surface, there is a net force pulling that molecule in the body of the solution. And in doing so, it will leave an empty space on the surface and another molecule will go and take its place. So this tends to minimize the actual um, surface, uh, the it tends to minimize the number of molecules of water that are exposed to the surface. And therefore, the water will tend to assume the shape that has the minimum um, surface area given a certain volume, and that is going to be this, a sphere. So when they are not subject to any other forces, uh, um, a, a given mass of water will tend to uh, assume a spherical shape. Surface tension is quite a strong force, and you might have experienced in the lab when you were doing the experiment with the collection of oxygen, and you had to use that uh, little square of glass uh, to close the flask when you were immersing the, the flask in the water. If you were uh, leaning, leaving the uh, uh, wet square uh, square piece of glass on the bench, it would almost feel like it was glued to the bench. It was really hard to lift it. The only way to detach it from the bench was to get it slide until the edge of the bench. Um, as I said, this is the reason why uh, droplets of water would take a spherical uh, shape. Um, the surface tension is also um, uh, the mechanism that some insects 
um, used to um, be able to walk on uh, quickly on water. Now, these droplets also don't have a perfect spherical shape because um, they are also adhering to the leaves. So in this case, we are seeing two phenomena happening at the same time. The adhesion of the water to the surface, because there is some sort of interaction, some sort of intermolecular forces between the water and the material of which the surface is made, and the cohesion that is the uh, hydrogen bonds inside the water trying to keep the water in a spherical shape. Uh, as a result of the combination of these two forces, we have the, a phenomenon that's called capillarity. You have observed a number of times in the lab that when water is inside a container that has a very thin diameter, uh, we can observe a meniscus, that is a uh, curved surface. And if the uh, um, tube is particularly small, the level of the water will increase uh, respect uh, to the surrounding. So you see, for example, in this um, series of tubes, uh, they are in communication, so the level of the water should be the same in each of the tubes. But as they get smaller and smaller, you see an increase uh, of the level of the liquid inside. So uh, the shape of the meniscus depends on the balance between uh, cohesive and adhesive forces. Adhesive forces make, make the uh, liquid stick to the walls of the, uh, in this case, let's say that this is a glass tube, make the substance sticks to the glass, while cohesive forces are uh, making uh, the liquid stick to other molecules of liquid. So if the adhesive forces are uh, prevailing, um, it is like saying that the liquid is able to wet the um, the tube, and you will see that uh, the meniscus uh, will have a concave shape. If instead the adhesive force are weaker than the cohesive force, the cohesive force are prevalent, the liquid uh, tend to have a, a convex meniscus. So colligative properties are particularly important properties of solutions. Uh, there are four of them. Um, so when we dissolve a substance in water, certain properties of the solution are going to change. The boiling point is going to change. It's going to be higher. The melting point is going to become lower. The vapor pressure is going to become lower. And we are going to observe uh, the appearance of osmotic pressure. The name colligative comes from the Greek word uh, kolikes, that means particle, so it's the same origin of the word collection. Um, and it is trying to um, highlight the fact that the extent of these properties, so for example, the extent to which the boiling point gets bigger, does not depend on the nature of the part particle, on their quality, it depends only on the quantity of the particle. Um, colligative properties have a practical application in that they can be used to determine the molar mass. Let's start by talking of the vapor pressure lowering. So in the presence of a solid that is represented by the blue dot uh, in this picture, um, the uh, vapor pressure of the solution will be lower. And this is because the evaporation of the water can only happen at the surface and the presence of the solid um, creates an obstacle uh, on the way of water trying to evaporate. Therefore, a lower number of molecules of water will be uh, able to um, evaporate, and there will also be a lower vapor pressure on top. The mathematical relation between the, uh, pressure, the vapor pressure of the solution and the concentration of uh, the solvent in terms of uh, molar fra mole fraction is the Raoult law, um, and in which P0 is the pressure of the pure solvent, so pure water. This animation shows you the um, surface um, 
if we would have like a magic microscope that would allow us to see uh, at, at a molecular level uh, the surface of, uh, of, um, of the beaker containing water, and you can see that some of the molecules of water are evaporating and some are condensing and going back into the liquid state. And so therefore, in equilibrium, you reach a certain value of pressure that depends on how many molecules of water you have in the vapor phase. In this case, we have the presence of a solute, uh, those large blue and green sphere. So the blue sphere would be the sodium ion, the, gr the green sphere would be the chloride ions. And uh, they uh, get in the way of the molecule of water that are evaporating. Therefore, you can see that on the top you have less molecule of water and you have a lower vapor pressure. So let's see an example of a calculation. Um, we have the number of moles of a non-volatile non-electrolyte um, that are dissolved in three moles of water, which is the vapor wash, uh, pressure of the resulting solution. And the vapor pressure of pure water at that temperature is going to be 23.8 torr. So the, we are given two information about solid. We are told, told that is a non-electrolyte, and this is important because if it's a non-electrolyte and we add 0 0.340 moles, we have 340 moles of solute in total. If we would be adding sodium chloride and we would be adding 0 0.34 moles, sodium chloride is a strong electrolyte, we would have 0 0.68 moles of particles in the solution. The other information is that the solute is not volatile, and this is an important thing to know because if the solute itself would be volatile, it would evaporate. So on top of the solution, you would have not just water, but also this solute, and so the total pressure would be higher, and the, and the calculation would be much more complicated. So the first thing we want to do is calculate the molar fraction of the solvent, so the molar fraction of the water. So the total number of moles is going to be 3.34, of which 3 is water. So we have to divide 3, divided 0 0.34 plus 3, and this gives us the molar fraction of the water, that is 0 0.89. So that's like saying that 89.8% is water, and the rest is uh, the non-volatile, non-electrolyte. At this point, we can plug the values in the Raoult law. This is um, the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, and this is the molar fraction, and uh, the product will give us the uh, vapor pressure of the solution. Um, the second um, colligative properties that we're going to consider is the boiling point elevation. It's called, also called a bouillonscopy. Uh, the pilot, so the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature in which the vapor pressure is going to be equal to the atmospheric pressure, as we've seen in um, another uh, video. Um, if we add a solute that, again, is non-volatile, so it's not altering the vapor pressure, uh, we already know that the vapor pressure is going to be lower, therefore we will have to raise the temperature more in order for the vapor pressure to uh, be equal to the atmospheric pressure. So the temperature at which the liquid will boil will be higher. There is a mathematical equation that describes um, this behavior quantitatively. So the increase in the uh, boiling point that is usually sort of final minus initial. So final is the boiling point of the solution. Uh, the initial would be the boiling point of the pure solvent. So this increase in the boiling point can be calculated by three factors. M is the molality, Kb is a constant, and I is a factor that's called Van Toff factor. The, ebullio, uh, the Kb, or ebullioscopic constant, depends on the solvent. So for water, for example, is 0.512 Celsius per kilogram per mole. Um, and uh, M is a molality. I is a factor that depends on the number of particles that you produce when you dissolve the substance. So if you have a non-electrolyte, I is going to be equal to 1. 
If you have sodium chloride, when you dissolve sodium chloride, you're producing one sodium ion, one chloride ion, so a total of two ions, so I is going to be two. When you uh, dissolve magnesium sulfate, it's also going to be two. But for example, for magnesium chloride, the dissolution of magnesium chloride will produce one magnesium ion and two chloride ions, so a total of three ions. So they tell us that dissolving the same number of moles of sodium chloride and of a non-electrolyte, like for example sugar, with sodium chloride, the effect on the boiling point is going to be twice as big than the one we would observe with a non-electrolyte, because we would have twice as many particles. And what matters is how many particles we have in the solution. Let's now see the lowering of the freezing point, freezing point depression. Um, the change in the temperature is, can be calculated by a formula that looks very much like the one we have just seen. Um, the change, uh, the lowering of the freezing point defined as the freezing point of the solution minus the freezing point of the solvent is going to be calculated as the uh, product of the molality, a constant, and the factor I. But this time, we have a minus sign in front of the formula. This is because the change in temperature is going to be a decrease. So if, for example, the temperature of the solution, uh, so the freezing point of water, once you add, let's say, sodium chloride, becomes minus 20, uh, minus the freezing point of the pure solvents is going to be zero, is going to give you a delta T of minus 20. That is negative. Um, so I is again the factor that keeps um, that counts for how many particles you get out of that particular compound. Uh, Kf is the uh, cryoscopic constant that is different from the ebullioscopic constant. So there is no relationship between the two. It's quite larger. Um, and this is why in the lab we do the uh, experimental determination of the freezing point depression rather than the determination of the increase of the boiling point because the effect would be much smaller and therefore the experimental error would become um, very problematic. The reason why the presence of a solute uh, makes harder for the water to solidify, it's because in the formation of ice, um, due to the crystalline nature of ice, it's necessary to um, achieve a very ordered uh, structure. And the presence of the solute kind of create um, a, um, a disarray in this, in this order structure. So the molecule of water are unable to find the proper point to make the crystal of ice. And this is pretty much what they are trying to show you in this slide, where the molecules of water are uh, uh, engaged into the solvation of the sodium ions, and they are not available to properly build a crystal vial. So the um, lowering of the freezing point is used, um, for example, when you want to make homemade uh, uh, ice cream. And by adding um, salt to uh, solution to ice, you can get as low as minus 30 Celsius. Um, so if you would do that in the lab, you would see that uh, you would have a beaker full of ice and you would start dumping spoon after spoon of sodium chloride. And you would see that the, uh, measuring with a, temp with a thermometer, that the temperature gets really, really cold. And you start forming a lot of ice on the outside of the of the beaker because the the uh, vapor in the in the air in the room is going to condense on this extremely cold uh, um, beaker now there is always a little bit of confusion in why the temperature drops so much the reason the temperature drops so much is not that the dissolution of sodium chloride is endothermic uh, the main reason the the, the uh, um, temperature is going to drop is because um, if we put ice and water in a beaker, we have an equilibrium and the temperature is stable uh, around zero Celsius. The moment we add sodium chloride, uh, the freezing point of the ice is going to drop to a much lower value. Therefore, the ice is going to melt 
because now it can be liquid at zero Celsius. The melting of ice is an endothermic process that are going to absorb heat. The only source of it is the solution, so the solution is getting colder. Um, if you want to make some ice cream, uh, you can watch this video uh, that gives you the proportion and the procedure to make some ice cream. That's totally uh, optional, of course. Um, in the engine of the car, uh, we add antifreeze, that is um, a solution mostly, the, the main component is ethylene glycol, that is this uh, structure shown here. Ethylene glycol dissolves in water in any proportion due to the similarity of the structure, like, dissolve like. So here you see the freezing point of mixture of water and ethylene glycol. So here you have 0% um, ethylene glycol, 100% water. So as expected, this uh, would uh, freeze at 0 Celsius. If you have 100% ethylene glycol and 0 water, it would freeze at minus 20. A mixture of the two has a freezing point that's lower than both the pure uh, substances. Um, in a proportion of about 70% of ethylene glycol, you can get as cold as minus 50 Celsius. That's a really, really low temperature. Commercial antifreeze is a 50-50 solution that um, allows, uh, that stays liquid until minus 33 um, Celsius. Um, the reason I put these puppies picture is that is because uh, uh, ethylene glycol is the main cause of accidental um, poisoning of pets in United States. So it's a very dangerous thing to keep in the house. It's quite toxic. Uh, what makes it particularly dangerous is it has a sweet taste. So a pet or even a, a small child that tries it keeps keeps drinking it. And, and so it's something that needs to be stored in the house with uh, some precaution. And so, so that's all for So actually, the last uh, slide is going to be about osmotic pressure. That is the last of our um, colligative properties. So if you um, have two containers with water and the, and the water is free to move from one container to the other, the level of the water um, in uh, uh, in the two containers is going to be exactly the same. However, in these examples, we are assuming that the two um, containers are separated by a semi-permeable membrane. A semi-permeable membrane is a membrane that lets only certain things go through. So, for example, water could go uh, from the left to the right and, and, and the opposite, but let's say sodium chloride would not be able to pass. Sodium ion chloride ion would not be able to go across the membrane. And this is the behavior that we see also in cell membranes, for example. Uh, so what's going to happen if we put a saline um, solution on this side so that the concentration on this side is going to be much larger than on the other side? Normally, if you mix a, a solution that has a lot of sodium chloride with a solution that has a small amount of sodium chloride in the same container, they would mix and equalize, and then eventually you will reach uh, an average um, concentration that's kind of halfway between the, the initial two. But in this case, the two solutions cannot mix, and the sodium chloride is unable to go from, um, from the right uh, to the left, so there is no way that the sodium chloride can go towards the side on which it is less concentrated. So the only um, thing that could happen is water going from here to here where uh, there is more salt. So as a consequence, we will see an increase of the uh, level of the um, liquid on this side and the increase corresponds to a difference in pressure that's a measure of the osmotic pressure. We could also think to apply a force, so to invest a certain amount of energy and push, uh, the, uh, apply uh, a pressure to push the water and force it to go on this side. The water that would be collected on this side would be uh, low, um, only pure water would go through, so 
uh, the water on this side would have a much lower concentration of salt, depending on how much salt was already here. And this is a way that is used, it's called reverse osmosis, is used to extract uh, drinkable water from uh, uh, sea water. The uh, osmotic pressure can be measured uh, using the uh, gas law, PV equal nRT. If we rearrange it, uh, solve it for P, uh, we get the ratio N divided, that's the number of moles, divided V, that's the volume in liter, that corresponds to a molarity. And we can also uh, introduce the uh, Van Top coefficient uh, to account for the different number of molecules that we would obtain, depending if we have a non-electrolyte or a strong electrolyte. So this time is really the end.